How are you looking at uh, the Asian and European economies? Because although they are bouncing back, they remain critically dependent on the, on the U.S. consumer, don't they? Yeah, yeah, sure. But I think the world has to learn that the U.S. is no longer as relevant as it was 20 years ago to the global economy. I mean, the share of, global, uh, of the U.S. in the global uh, economy has diminished very substantially. You have higher car sales in China than in the United States. And by the way, car sales today in emerging economies, including India and Latin America and China and so forth, are larger than in the G16 countries. In other words, larger than in Western Europe, the US and Japan combined. So we did also oil consumption in emerging economies today is larger than in the developed countries. So we're dealing with a totally new world. There has been a huge shift in the balance of economic power between the rich countries, the arrogant countries of the West, and the emerging economies that are coming up. And that also will lead to tensions, in my opinion, political and geopolitical tensions. How do you view uh, this entire brouhaha about uh, global warming and climate change? Is, is a settlement uh, really possible? And uh, what kind of opportunities are there for investors in this? The global warming alarmists, and they may be right. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. But even the scientists don't know for sure. There's a huge money behind global warming issues. If you have uh, energy conservation, and uh, you have this uh, global warming with carbon uh, credits and so forth. It's a huge business opportunity. It's also a huge business opportunity not to do anything about it. So the two sides are antagonized by each other, and they're going to fight it out like crazy. And the global warmists, they will say the others don't understand anything, and the others will prove to the global warmest that in the past thousand or two thousand years there were periods during which there were waves of warming climates and then waves of cooling climates. The last ten years, incidentally, the climate has cooled down. It hasn't been become warmer. But I have to admit, when I go to Switzerland, you know, the glaciers are smaller than thirty years ago. That I agree, but I hear both arguments. I cannot tell you what is the reality. I just don't know. I'm an economist. I'm not a scientist, and even the scientists disagree with each other. So does that then mean that crude oil prices will just keep rising and renewable sources of energy will simply not take off? It, it won't take off for a long time. And believe me, crude oil will day is still the cheapest alternative for energy. And I can see I live in the north of Thailand. I mean, the people in the countryside, they still drive the motorcycles. They're not going to have a motorcycle with the batteries, much too expensive. So in emerging economies, in the last 18 months, although we had a huge collapse in economic activity globally, the oil demand is still growing, and in the developed world it's growing down and so forth. I'm convinced that in Asia the oil demand over the next 20 years will more than double. So we consume today in Asia 22 million barrels a day. We'll go to something like 40 million barrels. The oil production in the world is 85 million, dollars, uh, 85 million barrels of oil a day. And every year we find new oil, but we use much more oil than we find new reserves. So essentially the reserve level in the world is going down. So eventually I suppose we'll have much higher prices. What do you say to someone like uh, Tom Friedman who believes that after information technology, the next big thing is going to be environmental technology. Well, I'm in favor of energy conservation. I mean, I'm, I don't think one should waste you know, energy and a lot can be done by building more energy efficient buildings and 
driving smaller cars and energy efficient engines and so forth. But I'm not, now not sure that the whole world will have solar panels on the roof and uh, will have um, windmills in the garden. And I don't know, I haven't made the calculation, but I presume that a lot of energy conservation measures use a lot of me energy to produce them. It's like ethanol is probably uh, not energy saving at all. Can we then infer that Mark Faber is totally and utterly negative on everything American? Well, I think the most obvious for me is that we had a U.S. government bond rally 1981 when yields were still at uh, the peak 15.84% until December 18, 2008, when the 10 years Treasury yield fell to 2.08% and the 30 years to 2.53%. Since then, yields on U.S. government bonds have gone up somewhat. On the 10 years, we're over 3.5%. But I believe that yields in America on government bonds will go up a lot in the next 10 years for two reasons. Either we have more inflation and an economic recovery and so uh, interest rates will have a rising trend to start with or we will have more inflation and that will mean that people will not want to own US government bonds or the foreigners will not want to buy them and 50% of US government bonds are in the hands of foreigners and the Fed has monetized massively this year both mortgage-backed securities and U.S. government bonds, if they start to withdraw the liquidity injection, which I think they can't do, but let's say if they gained sanity and would withdraw their monetizing, then obviously yields would go up. And the third reason they will go up is that the credit worthiness of the U.S. government will go up, down. In other words, if you have a depression in the U.S., and that's the argument of the deflation, is, if you have a depression, bonds will be a good investment. No, they won't be a good investment because the fiscal deficit will then balloon and stay around $2 trillion annually. And then the interest payments on the government debt will go up dramatically. And it will become one day questionable whether the U.S. government can ever repay their debts. Repay, they won't be able to do anyway. That is out of the question but just pay the interest on the debt will be a problem one day. So Mark Faber, what are your key investment themes and ideas for 2010? I uh, avoid US government bonds. I think as a contrarian, you really want a contrarian play, you should buy Japanese stocks and Japanese banks. This is the absolute contrarian play. Nobody is interested in Japan. All the funds uh, have withdrawn money from Japan, they've given up on Japan. I guarantee you the economy won't do well. Forget about the economy, the population is shrinking. But you can have an economy that essentially doesn't do well, but the companies do well. That is a big difference. And I think the Japanese banks are very depressed. All the banks in Asia have actually recovered very strongly, but not the Japanese banks. So as a contrarian play, I would look at that. Thank you very much, Mark, for sharing with us your keen insights. My pleasure.